Hello everybody, uh, I'm Dan, the editor of War Games Illustrated magazine, and today I'm joined by Steve Tibble. Hello Dan. Hello Steve. Thank you for having me. That's all right. So Steve is the, the author of this, or this is his most recent book anyway, it's called Templars, the Knights Who Made Britain. Uh, Steve's also been writing uh, for years for War Games Illustrated magazine. In fact, I was checking uh, this morning, Steve, and, and one of this wasn't your first, but August uh, 2018 was when you wrote for us previously, on one previous occasion, and that's when you had this book out, The Crusader Armies, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, we're going to talk generally about the Crusaders, perhaps focusing a little more on the Templars, but um, their connection particularly with wargaming and how they're represented yeah. on the wargaming table. And uh, we're going to do a, a three-pronged assault on your, uh, on, on your knowledge. <laughs> We're going to go with uh, strategy, tactics, and then uh, talk a bit about scenarios as well. So I'm hoping this video will be interesting to anyone who's interested in Steve's work, interested in Crusaders, Templars, but we are War Games Illustrated, so we'll keep pulling it back into Indeed. War Gaming if we Indeed. can. Indeed. Um, right, so first of all, you better tell us a bit about, we're going, to, we're going to start with the strategy side of it. Tell us a bit about the Templars and what they're, what their strategy was on the battlefield and, and how that can be translated onto the tabletop. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I, I am a historian, I write history books, but I've been a war gamer a lot longer than I've been a historian. So, um, yeah, my mind always comes back to war gaming when I'm writing. It's not always obvious, hopefully, in the books, mm. but I always return to that as my, my favourite hobby. The, I guess, on the table, the the key thing to remember about the Templars is that there weren't many of them, you know, and I think as war gamers, particularly the, mm. uh, when we're kids, when we started war gaming as kids, there's, we all have this kind of tiger tank mentality. You know, you take the most sexy thing that you can think of uh, and you say, yes, I'm going to, my army is going to be full of those things. So the temptation with the Templars is to, to have these super elite knights as, as being the main part of a crusader army. Now that is, just as realistic as having wheel-to-wheel -wheel tigers, king tigers, uh, on the table. You know, the main German vehicle in World War II was probably a horse. Really, if you look by numbers, it was a horse, much more likely than a tiger. You know, you might have one tiger on the table, but then they'd be supported by pans of fours, half-tracks, lorries, horses, whatever. It, they'd be like half a percent. And, and that's also true of the... Templars. Uh, if you think of a Crusader knight, so we, we, we put a Crusader army on the table and, and traditionally, and I've, I've been guilty of this when I was a kid as well, you, you'd put down ranks of knights and then they'd go into doing their stuff and they'd go charging. In reality, uh, knights were about 5 or 10% of a Crusader army. Um, they were fantastically important and they did, you know, they did brilliant work. They, were, they had a charge that was so difficult to stop, but they were relatively small. So if you're, if, you're, if you're putting a point scale to any set of rules, the knights have to be very expensive. Similarly with the Templars, they're almost the elite within an elite. You know, so of, of those Crusader knights, relatively small number would be Templars because there only ever were a few hundred fighting Templars in the, in the, in the Latin East. And there, there, was one, there was one really big battle, um, which we might come back to later as a scenario, uh, called Mont Gisard, where, where Saladin uh, nearly got killed and the, and the Templars nearly changed the course of history. Mm -hmm. But we know from, from uh, their kind of newsletters, their kind of propaganda newsletters that, that, uh, that re reached London, that uh, the Templars were the spearhead of the Crusader army. They had the whole weight of the battle on their shoulders. Um, and they charged twice into, into Saladin's ranks and they killed his nephew. They got to within a couple of yards of him uh, before he ran away and his army were decimated. But there were 84 of them, mm. 84. And that, you know, that wouldn't even make a squadron, you know, half a squadron in a Napoleonic army. These were, these were very powerful guys, but very limited in numbers. So to me, that's the most irritating thing when you look at a war games table. I do understand it. But it is that whole kind of tiger tank syndrome. Okay, so we established that there the weren't that many of them, but but as you pointed out, they were they were pretty tough. They were they were the toughest guys in the army. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely. Force, I should say. Yeah, definitely true. It and it's 
it works on lots of different levels. So they've got, uh, funnily enough, because of um, there's a document called the Rule of the Temple, which is basically their standard operating procedure. And thankfully, that's survived very unusually. Mm. So we've got a lot of detail about what the knights um, used to carry. And it's like a complete arsenal. It's like a shopping list for everything that a crusader knight would have liked to carry. You know, the, the right spear, uh, maces, swords. Mm. We also know a lot of the guys were really good with a bow and arrow or a crossbow as well. These were, you know, it's like a, an arsenal on a horse. Plus, they didn't just have one horse. You know, you have several horses. It's, I think it's better to kind of think of a Templar as, a, as, as the lead of a unit. Right. You know, so, because behind each Templar, you'd have squires, um, you'd have orderlies, you'd have light cavalry turkopoles, you'd have had guys who make, make the soup, but were still expected to get on an, an old nag and follow their, mm. their, their betters into a charge. You know, it's for, every, for every Templar, even in a Templar army, there'd, there'd probably be 10, 20, 30 other people. So they're, they're, they're genuinely tip of the spear. Mm. The, the brilliant thing about them as well is that they have fantastic weapon skills. So they're really difficult to stop. You know, once they're in a charge, if they can connect with the enemy, they are so powerful. They're really difficult to halt. Nobody wants to be in the way. And we know that from, from surviving chronicles written by Byzantines, who, although they were Christians, used to fight, you know, Crusader knights from time to time, uh, and, and from the Arabs and, uh, and the Turks and so on. Everybody respected a Templar charge because mm. you'd be foolish not to. But the other thing that was so great about it was that it wasn't, it was ferocious, but it was, it was under control. That's mm. the difference. You know, uh, anybody can launch a ferocious mm. charge. All you have to do is, you know, have enough to drink and, you know, you can do that. Mm. But the, the Templars were rigidly disciplined. They were the guys you wanted in the most difficult positions. So if you're on a march, they're the ones who hold the rear guard. They're the ones who do the difficult stuff in the vanguard. Um, mm. they've, got, they've got the control that's, that's so necessary as well. Okay, right. So, so we've, we've kind of segued into the tactics here a bit. Uh, and on the reverse of that, the, the tactics of the, um, of the Muslim armies, they were notoriously more lightly armed, the troops were lighter. Was it, was it a clash of styles between the two, the two armies? Yes, yes. It's, it's never quite as, obviously, it's never quite as clear cut as we think. So there's a lot of evidence to show that uh, a lot of the um, different Turkic and Fatimid armies, the Egyptian armies, were, were actually just as heavily armed as, as the Crusaders. There wasn't a big technological difference. It's not as if you could say that, say, an, an Egyptian Fatimid knight, heavy government, was, was particularly that different. They, in some ways, they probably looked very similar as well. And that's, that's a little bugbear of mine that, you know, that over, over time we, we tend to see the Crusaders as uh, these archetypical, um, you know, very sort of Walter Scott kinds of figures. In reality, they, I think they were much more scruffy than that. And probably the majority of quite a lot of Crusader armies were Arabs anyway. They were Christian Arabs or, or Muslim Arab mercenaries. It, there, it, it's not the kind of squeaky clean Western army that, that we imagine. But, but back to your point, um, a lot of the, the, the Askar, the heavy heavier cavalry of the Muslim armies were, were very, very similar to the Crusaders. I suspect the Crusaders' knights at their best probably were a little bit heavier and they had an elan. They, they really were elite troops, which is why the Muslims were not shy about saying that they were really twitchy about mm. when, the, when the, somebody like the Templars charged. And similarly, when Saladin captured Templars, he, um, he was very quick to execute them. You know, not not that I don't think I don't think he had a particularly burning hatred. It was mm. just he didn't want them coming back into battle. He didn't yeah. want to see the same Templar that, that he'd captured one day coming back the following day. So he was very ruthless in executing uh, Templar prisoners and and quite a few others. Mm, okay. But the big I mean to me the big difference mm. is that a, a Muslim army is very largely cavalry. So often you get uh, an invading Muslim army would be 100% cavalry or mm. very close to, whereas a Crusader army would probably be about 80% infantry. So that, so that regardless of how heavily armored or not you are, a, a Muslim army, a 100% cavalry army is gonna be much more maneuverable. And also historically, they're gonna outnumber the Crusaders. So you've got this kind of magic 
uh, horror story that the Crusaders are facing up to is uh, geographically they're surrounded. When you get to the battlefield, you're probably going to be surrounded because the enemy outflanks you. You're also going to be outmaneuvered because mm. the enemy are all on horses, whereas a lot of your guys are going to be fairly heavy, heavy infantry, halberd, crossbow, spear. You know, and they're going to be plodding along in the desert sun, mm. watching, watching the enemy going right round the flanks. So the, the Crusaders always had to be really careful how they, how they operated in the face of such you know, powerful and maneuverable cavalry armies. Mm. And aside from the Muslim cavalry, what about some of the more unusual units that we hear about on the uh, on the Islamic side? So things like the assassins. Right? Huh. Yes, well, they're, they're fabulous. I mean, I'm actually writing another book about them at the moment as well and their relationship to the Templars because, I, they, bizarrely, they did have quite a lot of uh, connections. It's not, it's not just a kind of internet conspiracy theory madness. It really is true. Mm. Um, yeah, they, I think it's it's a mistake to think of them as units. Um, the assassins were always this is this is a great conversation maybe for another day. But the assassins were effectively an oppressed religious minority, and often people like Saladin um, hated them and were trying to get rid of them. They tried to kill him on multiple occasions, nearly succeeded twice. Mm. Um, so it's they're not the kind of guys that you'd want to go on a beach holiday with or have loitering around on your flanks because, you know, God knows what they, they could be up to. They've always got their own agenda. But as a skirmish for a war game scenario, they are fantastic because they're so larger than life and they can do such extreme things. It is like a script from the Bourne Identity or something. Mm. These guys really are super skilled and they don't want to die. Uh, they're not they're not a suicide squad, but they don't mind dying. You know, if they're told to do something, they will do it, and they're, they're they're prepared to die in the process. And ironically, the Templars obviously very very similar. You know, they're not they're not absolute nutters, and certainly in the Christian tradition, suicide is not seen as a as a good way to go. But they're prepared to be brave and accept martyrdom through their bravery, um, even in the most difficult circumstances. Bedouin are another one. They're fabulous, and I've, I've written an article. Um, for War Games yes, Illustrated. Yes. Coming, coming up, yeah, yeah, um, this year. Which is, which is about how the Bedouin operate. And again, mm. the links they have with the Templars are fantastic because the good thing about the Bedouin is they, they were mostly Muslim. There were still some who were Christian who hadn't uh, converted to Islam. But, but in a way, that was completely irrelevant. The, these guys were the ultimate mercenaries. It really was about who was paying. That really was the only thing that they were interested in. So again, taking Saladin, for instance, he hated them. They they butchered his men uh, when they were if they were beaten in battle. If if you won the battle, um, they'd probably do their own thing and steal a lot of the plunder that was going to go to you anyway. If you lost the battle, they'd be cutting your throat before you before you left the field. Um, they they were famously people who fought for themselves. They lived in a a different moral universe. And it's not that they had no morals, but they were very, very different. And so in, in a sense, it's, it's, a, it's a big difference between those kind of nomadic values and sedentary values. And that kind of supersedes Christian versus Muslim. It doesn't really matter what, what kind of theological issues you're thinking about. These, these guys are just uh, incredibly untrustworthy. And the, the Templars, because they were so flexible in their allegiances, they, are, they often worked with, with the Templars. And again, you'll, you'll, you'll see, or you'll, the readers will hopefully see very soon, um, there are scenarios where you have Templars and Bedouin attacking Egyptians or Turks, and uh, yeah, and, and the Bedouin perform very well just because they're highly motivated to do it because there's a lot of money at stake. Okay, yeah, good. Yes, that's, that's certainly one to look out for. Yeah, uh, Bedouin and Barons is an article that's coming up uh, later this year, probably October or November issue of the magazine. Okay, so um, if I've got a force of Templar Knights on the tabletop, um, we've already established that I shouldn't have too many of them, really, not as, as strictly Templars, but am I going to be indestructible? Mm, yeah, well, that's, yeah, that's a good point, Dan. That's, um... That's, I think, again, that's another thing that all war gamers kind of assume is, you know, there is this tendency to feel like, oh, I've paid 25 points for this figure, so it's jolly well going to be indestructible and so on. And that, that is something that goes with the reputation of the Templars as well. I mean, they, they were incredibly good and you put them in the right situation and they can perform very well. But 
And this is, this is where it's important on the war games table. The but should be, for a good set of rules, is confining what those right circumstances are. So if, if a Templar can go into battle with his flank supported by Turkopoles, say, so who are the equivalent of the Turkish enemies they used to face, um, their Turkopole role in the charge would be to try and just make sure that the, that the brothers could get in and do their stuff. They just need to hold the enemy back for a couple of minutes. They don't need to, to win the battle. They just need to buy time. Um, and if, if the circumstances are right, I think a good set of rules will penalize you if you don't have stuff like that in hand, but will, will give you real bonuses and make them superb if they connect under the right circumstances. The, the other issue is that because there are so few of them, they are quite fragile to taking casualties, and particularly the horses, you know, as, as ever, it's the horses and the archery that will be the downfall. So a, a good Templar charge will be about maneuvering them behind other troops, particularly infantry, and then being able to get the infantry out of the way so that the, the Templars can, can push through very quickly, Turkopoles on the flanks, and get to the enemy before they have a chance to, uh, to get away. Okay, all right. Um, I just want to ask you briefly about the look of, of the Templars hmm. as well. I mean, we've got a few figures here. Um, what, what I tend to find with war gamers is they obsess on the look of the figure, and historians less so. <laughs> you might think it would be the other way around. But um, I, I, our Templars always pretty much dressed in, in white, which I think we're off to a good starting point there, aren't we? That was, there was no uniform, was there? I don't think they all lined no. up and got given no. a uniform. It's not it's pre-industrial age, yeah. yeah. So we, we we don't want to go overboard on uniformity. No, but um, but white was the colour, and then late a bit later on, they were given the uh, the red cross, or they started putting the red cross on their um, surcoats and shields and things and, mm. and flags, I guess as well. Uh, but in, in the very early days, there was not not even that, was there? No, I mean the, the very early days, um, they would have looked like a bunch of tramps. Basically, they were they were. Uh, of tiny bodyguard, they were basically the bouncers for the Holy Sepulchre, which is the the, you know, the main holy place for for Christians. It's the the church over the spot where Jesus was supposed to have been crucified and, and come back to to life. Um, and they were the bouncers there. There were only about a dozen of them or less, and they survived uh, on people giving them handouts of secondhand clothing. So you combine that with uh, lack of bathing facilities and um, Middle Eastern climate, and you can imagine the the smells and the and the looks that you would have had. So, definitely, I wouldn't go for cleanliness being next to godliness. I don't think they, the the Templars were in that league at all. So, when it comes to painting, probably quite a bit of weathering on your figures then. Weathering, especially if the lads are on campaign. If the, you know, if it's people just leaving the castle, okay, they might, you know, the white might still look white, yeah. but um, once they've been riding around a desert for a, a day or two. These, these guys are going to be, you know, they're going to have dust in their faces mm. the whole time. You know, they, haven't, they won't have washed. Um, their clothing will have been used and torn. Um, so that, that, they will be quite different. The other thing to mention, really, is that, again, it's the tiger tank syndrome. We think of Templars, we think of white, we think of crosses. If you, if you think of it, a lot of the majority of the guys in the Templar force were not brothers. You know, they'd have been squires, they'd have been cooks. There, there were Templar knights who were guys who were temporarily members, people who were, say, married, wanted to do some good work in the, in the Holy Land and then would go back to their families. You know, these would be, uh, they, they called them ad terminum. So they were, they were basically kind of part-timers, so a con contract, you know, they were mm. brave volunteers, but they wouldn't necessarily have been dressed in the full kit or in quite the same way. So the, I think there'd been a, a wide range of, of uniforms, even though, and I think uniform is the wrong word. Yeah. Um, and that's before you start getting into the mercenaries who could be basically people wearing, I imagine, pretty much what they want. A lot of the Turkopoles would have been uh, Arab Christians themselves anyway. Um, with any number of different kinds of headgear. We, ev we even have, which is brilliant from a war games perspective, we do have some um, icons that have survived that show effectively what people used to think were Muslim troops, uh, mm. things like the crucifixion. And in fact, they're not. They're, they're basically, that's what the army of the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem looked like. 
It was because, you know, most of the guys were probably Christian Arabs. Yeah. So for them, it just made sense to paint these guys. They weren't painting the enemy next to Jesus. They were painting what they thought a normal soldier looked like. So I, I think we can really be a little bit more creative. And I think that the wonderful thing is that so many manufacturers, um, these, these are foot sore, I think, um, but so many manufacturers have been a lot more creative recently. Yeah. And, and you do see more turbans going around. You do see, uh, you know, guys that, that look scruffy. And I think that's all to the good. And they've gone a bit negative, haven't they, a lot of them? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we've got, we've got um, these are foot sore. We've got foot sore here. We've got Gripping Beast as well, which, which are quite a similar style. Yeah, and lovely. then we've got uh, Fire Forge, which are perhaps a bit more of your traditional look of, of what if nice. your stereotypical... Um, Templar, I think, yeah. with the flowing cloaks, that's always an important Well, that's beautiful, that, that, and that's not wrong. I wouldn't be saying that was wrong. Yeah. I, I just think that um, if you had 100% of your army looking like that, that would be uh, unrealistic, yeah. actually. Okay. Right, so the last prong of my attack on your uh, intelligence hmm. is, is uh, talking <laughs> about scenarios. And I also want to bring back the British connection as well, because uh, um, let's just point out again that the, the book is... Um, is focused on the um, British, British connection with the Templar Knights. Now they yeah. were a pan-national force, anyway, weren't they? Yes, it wasn't absolutely. that they were all British. Although yeah. I know in the book you you talk a, a lot about how they were involved in the formation of the British state. That's perhaps a yeah. No, that's true. Yeah. Okay. So, um, but when it comes to getting the figures on the table and the Templars on the table, what, of course, as Wargamers we like to do is, is create scenarios. And yes. we've, we've no shortage of characters and situations that we could bring into scenarios, yes. have we? Yeah. Um, can you tell me a bit about um, Gilbert de Lacey? Is it Gilbert yeah. de Lacey? Gilbert of Lacey? Yeah. yeah. Um, he's, he's a character who have uh, been interested in and could possibly bring to the table top. What, yeah. what was he all about? Yeah, he was great. I mean, you're absolutely right, Dan. The, the, the wonderful thing about the Templars is... Um, the, al although there are so few of them, well, in fact, because there are so few of them, the, it kind of puts the onus on us to to pick out the individuals where we can. And actually, because they're larger than life characters, it's they do lend themselves to that so well. So, as you rightly point out, Gilbert of Lacey, uh, he's another another English Midlands guy. So he's he's um, used to own Ludlow Castle, um, beautiful castle. Um, he he became a Templar. Um, in the late 1150s, and extraordinarily, by 1160, you find this kind of English English guy from the Midlands is running the defence of Lebanon. That so he's in charge of the Templar forces and the fortresses along the frontiers of Lebanon, the, along the you know the Shif, Shif Valley and so on. So clearly, a very very resourceful guy. He nearly changed uh, the course of history, and I think this would be a fabulous. Fabulous uh, scenario. It, there was a battle called the Battle of La Boquet up in the up in the mountains, the Bekar Valley, um, and Saladin's predecessor, a guy called Nuraldin, uh, was leading an army there. And and Gilbert managed to bounce the whole of the the Muslim army. Um, I don't know how he managed to do it because you know he's got much heavier troops. He's moving more slowly. But for whatever reason, however, he was super clever and managed to surprise. Um, Nuraldin before he could order his troops properly. Uh, Nuraldin uh, ended up running for his life, pursued by the Templars in much the same way as as, uh, as, as Saladin was just, just a few years later. Um, sadly, we haven't got a lot of detail on the battle because there are no chronicles of the Crusader state of Lebanon. But as a war gamer, secretly, I'm quite pleased with that because it allows my imagination to run wild. And you've got a beautiful scenario here where you've got a lot of mountainous, um, hilly territory, you've got a valley, you've got um, Turkic troops, um, tents, baggage train, and you've got, got the Templar Knights, uh, probably with Maronite allies as well. A lot of uh, Maronites, Christian, um, eventually became Catholic as well. They were just in negotiations with, with the church at this point. And they even, and, and to this day, are still very closely uh, aligned with the Catholic Church. So you've, you've got these two very exotic forces meeting. Um, and because we haven't got details, we can let our imaginations run riot. And I just love the idea of this, you know, it's not quite a brummy, but you know what I mean? It's sort of, it's a <laughs> Midlands England, English guy running, running the defense of Lebanon like that. 
So okay. that's 1163, if anybody wanted a date for it. I think that could be a really interesting scenario. Okay, uh, character from a little bit further south, um, Robert of um, St <laughs> Albans. Um, what, what, was, what was he about? What was his shtick? Yeah, well, he... Yeah, good question. Cra crazy guy. Crazy name, crazy guy. So, so Robertus of St. Albans uh, was a Templar Knight, an English Templar Knight. And for reasons that we don't know, I th and people must have known at the time and they didn't want to say what it was, so it must have been fairly embarrassing. For whatever reason, he went completely off the rails. So you have this English senior, English Templar, it seems, um, who in the early 1180s, um, for, some, for some reason, maybe there was a misdemeanor, maybe there was a sexual misdemeanor, or maybe he fell out with his colleagues. He just went completely doolally. He, he escaped from the order, managed to get across to, uh, to uh, the Turkish armies and, and Saladin, and volunteered himself to be a cavalry commander. And fair dues to Saladin, he, he could... He could spot an opportunity. I mean, partly it must have been a PR opportunity, but it was also he had a, you know, a Templar commander that, at his disposal. So in 1185, he gave dear Robert um, a whole cavalry army and said, go on then, if you, you know, you're talking big. Ro Robert actually claimed that he could take Jerusalem um, because the Crusader armies were spread fairly thin. So he took this cavalry army round to Jerusalem, uh, killed a few civilians, and then got completely trashed by the uh, Jerusalem militia when they turned up. So he, he was kind of talking and not, and right. not delivering. Okay. There, there is a story that he, he um, was given Saladin's niece uh, as a wife as well. So clearly he'd become a Muslim by this point. And, and uh, I, I personally doubt that it was Saladin's niece, but it does sound like he settled down and had a nice Muslim family. So it's, it's a, again, a really weird story. And that's the thing I love about the Templars. They are so larger than mm. life. They are eccentric, yeah. kind of crazy. You, know, yeah. they, you find a lot more Templars go over to the other side than, than you'd expect. Okay. Right. Yeah, because they get to a certain point and I think they just break. So right. it just looks beautiful. I think it would be really interesting on the War Games table to have, to have you know, at least one Templar leading, leading yeah. a Muslim army against the army of the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem with a, you know, the walls of Jerusalem in the background, which is where most of the fighting took place. Yeah, yeah, that would be great, yeah. Moving forward in time, I just want to ask you about one more uh, character, an anonymous English Templar who was involved in the, the Last Charge. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a very, very sad story, but again, a very powerful one. And it's, and it's one that lends itself very well to a, um, a very, yeah, a very powerful, a very engaging little skirmishing scenario. So basically the scene is the 18th of May, 1291, and it's um, in Acre. Acre's the last big Christian city left. It's surrounded by about 30,000 uh, Mamluk soldiers who've been besieging it. Um, they eventually break in. And I don't know if you know, Acre is a, is a concentric castle. So a bit like Carcassonne, there's, there's actually room in between the two walls to launch a charge down. So the Mamluk troops break through the gates early in the morning. The Templar troops are the closest ones, but there's, as always, very few of them. And the master of the Templar, the master of the whole order is there, a guy called William of, of, of Beaujeu. And he rushes to put on his armor, doesn't get all his armor on, he gets all his guys with him. But, but when we say all his guys, we're talking about 14 men. Right. So we've got 30,000 besieging troops starting to pour through. Uh, a lot of them are sort of combat engineers. They've got naphtha, hand grenades, effectively napalm. They're probably up on the top of the outer set of walls at this point. So, so what happened was William managed to get his 12 or 14 uh, mounted troops together. And, and luckily, bizarrely, one of his household knights uh, or troops wrote an account of this afterwards. So it's, it's, it's really this kind of dozen Templars plus, plus a few household guys charging down this funnel. It's a bit like the Charge of the Light Brigade, you know, it's, uh, except with far less chance of success. I mean, there's clearly no chance they're going to succeed. Mm. But they do it because that's the kind of crazy guys they are. And they are doing it for a reason. They're trying to, from a war game's perspective, the objective is to buy time. Because the more time you can delay 
the, the Mamluk troops coming in, the more times civilians have get, got to go to the port and then they can take ship back to Europe. So it, you're allowing the civilians to escape or find refuge. So William, William did this. Um, he, he sadly died. Um, he, he got wounded under his left uh, arm because he hadn't got time to put his um, armor on properly. So in terms of war gaming, you know, there, there has to be, these aren't the invulnerable Templars that mm. you'd quite often see. These are guys who are half dressed. Um, but there was one particular English squire, a Templar squire, who his horse was, was taken out, probably archery or javelins. He hits the ground. And while he's struggling to get up, uh, a whole bunch of naphtha hand grenades go off and his, his surcoat set on fire. And the guy who was there, who wrote the Chronicle afterwards, uh, wrote that he basically just burnt to death on the ground. You know, his face was melting and what have you. So Gosh, it's... Um, to go. Yeah. Mm. And to me, that, you know, the Templar Order has inspired a million crazy conspiracy theories. But this was their last charge. That right. literally was the last charge that the Templars ever did. And the English were right in there. There was a British contingent in that tiny little force of, you know, that tiny band of brothers. And it would have been so much better if the order had just finished there, mm -hmm. you know, and it wouldn't have been involved in all the sort of mad, mad stories. Now, if they'd ended on that high, it would have been perfect. But to me, that is a, it's a little gem of a little scenario, you know, because mm -hmm. you don't have to have too many figures. You don't even have to have a big table because it's effectively um, between 12 and 20 people charging down a, what is a large corridor um, and fighting it out and fighting for time. So I, I think a, a nice little one for Christmas, you know, those long winter evenings. <laughs> yeah, that's great. There's so much ammunition in there, isn't there? Yeah. For different scenarios, oh. different war games. Um, th that's great, Steve. Thanks very much. That's been a fascinating conversation. Uh, so Steve's book, Templars, The Knights Who Made Britain, is out now. He's also going to continue writing for War Games Illustrated. Very we've much got so. We've got three articles in the bag that will be coming up. Uh, uh, over the later this year and probably into next year as well. Uh, but for now, thank you very much, Steve Tibble. Yeah, thank you, Dan, and thank you for yes. watching. This video has been brought to you by WI Prime, War Games Illustrated Magazine's online members club. View more videos or find out more about WI Prime by following these links.